know, we usually think about the video game industry coming into its own in the 70s. Um, with the birth of Atari, things like that. But it actually goes back a bit further than that. When in 1958, a physicist named Willie Higginbotham, we're not making that up, at the Brookhaven Labs here in New York, created a game called Tennis for Two that worked on an oscilloscope screen. This was an era when computers were the size of rooms still. Uh, computers weren't things you bought and brought home, so it kind of went unnoticed. It wasn't really a practical thing yet. It wasn't until a couple years later, 1961, that Steve Russell at MIT created Space War, the first real computer game. Video game Games and science fiction have always been good friends, and the first computer game was called Space War, which was the most generic title available at the time. Space War was a pretty crude game, and it was done by Steve Russell and his friend, a spaceship trying to shoot another spaceship, done on a huge computer, and they did it just to prove that they could do it. They built the game for themselves. They built it on a machine that only a few people in the entire United States would have access to, and they just enjoyed the hell out of it. The thing about these first two video games is they weren't built with any kind of commercial potential in mind. It's not like these guys were making these games and selling them out of the back of a truck somewhere. They were just experiments with equipment they already had in the lab. If Higginbotham and Steve Russell sort of invented video games. It was Ralph Baer and Nolan Bushnell who actually developed it as a business. Now in 1966, Ralph Baer works for Sanders Associates. They're like Halliburton. They're a top secret military contractor. But he's secretly using his budget and his resources at work to chase this crazy dream of a TV you can play. And during Vietnam, when he was supposed to be working on winning Vietnam, instead he was building video games, which kind of explains some things. In 1968, Baer invents and patents a ping pong style game. And then, Realizing, okay, there might be a market for this, he starts calling up television companies to see if there's any interest in buying this and kind of bringing it to market. Finally, in 1970, Magnavox bites, and they plan to release Bear's creation as what would be the first home video game console known as the Magnavox Odyssey. Ralph Bear is really an engineer type. He's the kind of guy who'd happily sit in a dark room by himself for hours working on projects. In the meantime, you got Nolan Bushnell, who's kind of this freewheeling hippie type. He's the kind of guy that you'd find smoking a cigar in a hot tub with women all around him. Yeah, Ralph Bear and Nolan Bushnell are like a buddy cop movie. You know, one's a free-thinking hippie, and the other's like a straight-laced guy who doesn't want a new partner. And uh, Nolan Bushnell is that new partner. Here's a guy who lost his college tuition in a card game and then had to go work at an amusement park where he kind of ran all the coin-op games there. But it was there at the amusement park that he got a love for coin-op games and more importantly figured out how the business works. And was starting to just get a feel for the showmanship that goes into getting people to play your games, it goes into getting people to stock your games. And so he was actually building up the entrepreneurial know-how. Um, and combined with what was already a pretty charismatic personality, you know, he was going to go far. So Bushnell eventually goes back to college. He goes to Utah. Now, that's one of only four colleges in the country, including MIT, where they actually have these big room-sized supercomputers. He stumbles across a copy of Steve Russell's Space War, and he says, wait a minute, this is the future right here. I have to take this thing that sits on this gigantic computer and find a way to put it in a box that somebody can put a quarter into. Then, in 1971, Bushnell designs and ultimately releases what will be considered the first arcade coin-op video game, which is essentially Space War, but he calls it Computer Space. He took Space War and turned it into the much less interestingly titled Computer Space. Really, that is a much worse title. To take the word war out... He, he replaced the wrong word. He strips it out to bars and, you know, bowling alleys, things like that, and the game tanks. Nobody plays it because it's too complex. I mean, it was a physics simulation, which you had buttons that would increase your left thruster and your right thruster. It wasn't an immediately intuitive game for just anyone to get into. So the game doesn't do spectacularly well, but the idea is planted. Bushnell goes on to say, I've got to start a company to make more of these games. Thus is formed Atari. Now it's 1972. Magnavox has taken the Odyssey around, shopping it at like trade shows and private screenings and things like that. And Bushnell gets to see it. He plays it and he instantly falls in love. And he sees the, the tennis style game with the uh, paddles and the ball. And he says, this is what I should have done. Computer space was too complicated. I got to pull it back and make something really simple that people can understand. He decides to make his own version of that. He goes on to call it Pong and it becomes the first video game hit. Pong is still kind of a cultural milestone. Even people that don't like video games at all can probably tell you the first really popular video game was Pong. So 1972 was a watershed year for video games, right? On one hand, you had Pong in the arcades, which was the first coin-operated arcade hit, and then Magnavox released the Odyssey for, you know, home. Almost immediately, Magnavox sues Atari because Bushnell basically stole the game. 
And Magnavox knows this, and Magnavox is like, look, Atari, we have patents for the ping pong style game, and we have patents for the first TV game. It's been disputed, you know, for years. Nolan Bushnell has always said, oh, I, I, I never saw that table tennis game they were working on. Uh, but it's funny, he signed the guest book at, you know, one of these private showings, which would later come back to haunt him. But back then, nobody really saw video games as being a multi-billion dollar industry, so they settled that accord and Atari agreed to pay Magnavox basically a small licensing fee. So after the settlement, Bushnell and Bear finally meet. It's like, they meet, shake hands, pleasant meeting, and then pretty much walk their separate ways. So the two men went in their different directions, as did their separate projects. The Magnavox Odyssey tanked, and Atari took off. Yeah, I don't know. When was the last time you ever heard Magnavox being associated with video games? Besides this episode, I guess. Ironically, knowing Bushnell's first two games, Computer Space and Pong, they were basically kind of stolen from other people's ideas. Once Pong became a big hit, however, other copycats came in and they started stealing all of his Pong business. After Pong becomes a huge hit and everyone rips it off, Bushnell's like, wait a second. We have to find a way to stay ahead of these copycats. And so what they start doing is releasing game after game after game that are really original games, really just creative games that the copycats can't keep up with. And that's when Atari really, really starts to blow up because they just have so many games. Because of Atari's success, Noah Bushnell became world famous as the father of the video game, even though he had kind of borrowed most of the ideas from other people. Meanwhile, Ralph Baer was kind of forgotten, even though he was the real father of the video game. Bushnell was fairly flamboyant and the media just totally ate it up. And so he was always the one on the camera, and he was always just kind of by default the one credited with inventing video games. So Bear, the engineer, gets his revenge in the end through a game called Simon. Now Simon, for people who don't remember, is this game with four lights that you would have to mimic the pattern that the game gives you. I mean, it's pretty creative, and the game goes on to sell like wildfire. I mean, everybody loves Simon. Well, there's a little bit of payback here because Ralph Baer saw an early Atari game called Touch Me back in 1974, and that was a very simple follow the repeating lights pattern. And he said, that's a pretty good idea. I gotta do something with this. Just like Bushnell took, uh, you know, a version of Bear's table tennis game, and basically just improved upon it when he released Pong. Bear did the same with Touch Me, turning it into Simon, adding colors, adding musical notes to just make it a more addictive experience that you can then play at home. After Simon goes on to be a huge hit, Bushnell says, wow, we should release a handheld version of Touch Me. So they release it and it tanks because everyone thinks it's a ripoff of Simon, when in reality, Simon is a ripoff of Touch Me. In the end, Bushnell is credited as the father of video games, and Bear is credited as the father of the electronic memory game Simon, but in reality, it's actually reversed, uh, which means nothing to anyone except Bushnell and Bear. Even though he didn't get the credit he deserved, Ralph Bear would actually resurface again in 1980. He had developed a very early digital camera technology that he wanted to put in arcade games. And the reason for this is so that people, once they get a high score on a video game, they could take their picture to put it next to the high score. Sounds like a great idea, right? Well, of course, by day two, some guy got a high score, and then he gets up and uh, immediately starts the... <laughs> So it lasts one day on the streets of Chicago, and then the company pulls it. This establishes one of the main rules of technology. If someone can use it to show someone else their balls, they will. But the digital imaging technology behind it actually was very useful. They used it in the Journey game to get the musicians' faces into the game. First time anyone had ever done that, and that went on to be the technology behind Mortal Kombat, digitizing entire people and putting them into the game. This guy's a genius. I mean, he keeps coming up with innovative things. And, you know, a digital camera in 1980 to put an image in a video game? Come on, that's pretty unheard of. So of course by now these two guys are both long retired, but they can sit back and think of themselves as the Romulus and Remus who co-founded the video game empire that has pretty much single-handedly conquered popular culture. There's a lot of people who were involved in the development of video games as an art form, but Bushnell and Bear started video games as a business. And today video games are just as big as books, movies, music, and they're better. Both Bear and Bushnell are retired and they pretty much just sit back and watch this video game industry that they created grow in a way that they never thought would have been possible. 